Welcome to Idlewild Cottage, a quiet place where kindred spirits can linger together over a cup of tea, savoring all things lovely and cozy. My name is Juliana, and I'm delighted to have you. Each episode here at the cottage will center around a theme. That theme will be celebrated in a number of ways, through literature, art, nature, and even some favorite movie scenes, we'll cherish the sweet and simple things of life. So make yourself at home, and I'll put the kettle on. The year was 1989. Our little family of five, along with dear friends, wound our way from the campsite through the forest in search of treasure. Up, up, up the hills we climbed through the cool shade of the trees, finally emerging at the peak of Little Huckleberry Mountain. Herbie, our faithful companion, wagged his dachshund tail in triumph. His little legs had successfully made the climb, too. Out there in the open, surrounded by miles and miles of Cascade Mountain vistas, the September sun was brilliant and warm. We shed layers and set to work. There were huckleberries to harvest. Moments like these held irresistible charm for me as I grew up. It was as though I was a real-life Laura Ingalls, gathering berries in the woods, and my mom was a real-life Ma, back again at our campsite, tossing a generous scoopful of huckleberries into our morning pancake batter. Most of us these days forage for the pleasure it brings us, rather than from a sense of necessity. Today, we'll look at both the pleasurable and practical nature of foraging for treasures such as berries, nuts, and herbs. We'll draw on literature, art, a movie scene, and more to inspire our time together. Why not start right off with Laura Ingalls and her ma? In this setting, we see the necessity of foraging. I'll share from Chapter 15 of Little House on the Prairie. Now blackberries were ripe, and in the hot afternoons, Laura went with Ma to pick them. The big, black, juicy berries hung thick in briar patches in the creek bottoms. Deer lay in the shady groves and watched Ma and Laura. Blue jays flew at their sunbonnets and scolded because they were taking the berries. In the trees, the squirrels woke up and chattered at them. Laura's fingers and her mouth were purple-black with berry juice. Her face and her hands and her bare feet were covered with briar scratches, but every day they brought home pails full of berries and Ma spread them in the sun to dry. Every day they ate all the blackberries they wanted, and next winter they would have dried blackberries to stew. A writer who regularly incorporated nature as a significant element in her stories is Jean Stratton Porter. Stratton Porter was an American author and naturalist who lived from 1863 to 1924. She centered many of her stories around the Limberlost Swamp of Indiana. You may be familiar with some of her titles, such as Freckles, Laddie, and A Girl of the Limberlost. Her 1911 book, called The Harvester, introduces us to David Langston a young man who relies on the roots and herbs of his woodlands, which he calls medicine woods, for his very livelihood. The medicinal properties of this forest bounty eventually bring strength and healing to the fair young bride of David's dreams. Along the way, he delights in teaching her about the land. We read, Through the cooling fall days they worked together. They were very happy. Before her wondering eyes, the harvester hung branches, burrs, nuts, berries, and trailing vines with curious seed pods. There were masses of brilliant flowers, most of them strange to the girl. While she sat bending over them, beside her the harvester delved into the black earth of the woods or the clay of the open hillside and lifted large bagfuls of roots that he later drenched drained, and dried. While he gathered trillium roots, the girl made drawings of the plant and learned its commercial value. 
she drew Lady Slipper and Solomon's seal and learned their uses. She carefully traced wild ginger leaves while nibbling the aromatic root. This young bride and groom remind me of cinematic newlyweds, Adam and Millie Potopy. Seven Brides for Seven Brothers is one of our family's all-time favorite musicals. Adam is a mountain man in search of a wife, so naturally, he makes a trip into town to find one. Millie is eager to escape her demanding work at the inn where she daily feeds a pack of scroungy mountain men and willingly hops into Adam's wagon. After quickly yet solemnly exchanging their vows, Adam and Millie make the drive back up to the cabin. At a watering stop along the way, Millie spies a field of herbs and eagerly begins to harvest, calling it her wedding bouquet. Adam questions her. Sorrel? Millie replies, makes real nourishing soup. And then, of course, she launches into a song. It's not until they reach the cabin that Millie learns of Adam's six brothers who also live on the property. Millie assesses the situation and meekly replies, I guess I should have picked more sorrel. This scene would have taken place in the spring when sorrel is flourishing. So let's now turn our attention to autumn harvest. Gladys Tabor's Still Meadow books chronicle month by month the rhythms of life surrounding her 17th century Connecticut farmhouse. Her fall recollections are especially cozy. I'll share from an October entry. Nut gathering has all the aura of tradition with us. With old gunny sacks over our shoulders, we climb the pasture slopes. Here the outcropping ledges are warm and gray, but have delicate colors laid over the stone. We go up to the farther lot where the butternuts have their tawny leaves lifted against the soft sky. The butternuts are cinnamon or black suede color. We fill the gunny sacks and then wander on to the hickory trees. It is still and peaceful up here, and the air has a dreaming quality. When we have wandered as far as we need, for the gunny sacks do get heavy very soon, we move to the biggest ledge of all, where there is a nice, flat place to spread a picnic supper. Nut gathering is also a tradition celebrated by my brother and his family. They live in Slovenia, and every October finds them ascending Chestnut Hill to harvest this delightful crop. Today, I am eager to share their experience through the eyes of my niece, Kinsley, who described Chestnut Day for me. A relatively short, wooded drive from their home finds Kinsley and her friends and family at the Chestnut Hut, located at the base of Chestnut Hill. Armed with bags, gloves, and hiking boots, they wind their way up through the forest paths. The October sun shines through the trees with a subtle light. The leaves are transitioning from green to orange and yellow now, and many crops of mushrooms line the paths. As they find clusters of chestnuts, they break off the prickly outer shell with a stomp of their boots and pop the kernels into their bags. Finally, with a supply in hand, they head back to the hut where the chestnuts are scored and roasted, yes, over an open fire. They exchange their harvest for a freshly roasted bagful, find a nearby picnic table, and nibble on their snack. The chatter of birds, the aroma of roasting chestnuts, and the familiar sound of accordion folk music round out this delightful fall experience. Thank you, Kinsley, for inviting us to share in this fun tradition. I've had the pleasure of staying at the Chestnut Hut, and one of my fondest memories is sharing a farm-style breakfast with friends and family around the long dining room table. The morning menu consisted of farm-fresh eggs, thick slices of homemade bread, bright red tomatoes, meats, cheeses, and more. My favorite part, though, was the tea. Our hostess, Iveta, had gathered fresh herbs and steeped them for the freshest tea possible. She shared her recipe with me, so let's imagine we are enjoying a fragrant cup 
of this herbal medley. Hyssop, ladies' mantle, sage, lemon verbena, century, yarrow, oregano, and lavender. As we sip and savor, we'll peek into the Idlewild post to hear from another niece of mine, Clara. I was visiting with her about this week's foraging theme, and she eagerly referred me to some passages from the Grandma's Attic series about nut gathering and berry picking. I'll share one of those selections in just a moment, but I first want to introduce you to these stories through Clara's recommendation. Clara shares that the Grandma's Attic books were written by Arleta Richardson and take place in the 1860s. They are based on the life of the author's grandmother, Mabel. Richardson writes with a fun mixture of comedy, mischief, and heartwarming softness. These stories have a coziness that very much reminds Clara of Idlewild Cottage. Clara's favorite scenes are those centering around simple pleasures, such as chums Mabel and Sarah Jane finishing up their chores so they can head down to the creek to play with their dolls. Clara can just picture the sweet time the girls would have had there in the green pasture by the water's edge, surrounded by flowers and sunshine. These are books to return to again and again. Clara, thank you for sharing this series and for encouraging us to cherish the sweet and simple things of life. Let's enjoy a passage now from Grandma's Attic. In this scene, we find Mabel and Sarah Jane helping with a fun Saturday afternoon chore. Ma asked us to gather a basket of butternuts for her. This is probably the last time we can get them, Ma said, as she handed a basket to us. It's going to snow soon. We agreed and took the basket, swinging it happily between us. Pep tagged along, pausing now and then to sniff through a pile of leaves or run ahead as he spied a squirrel in the path. I sure do like Saturdays, Sarah Jane said. Isn't it fun to just walk through the leaves and not be in a hurry to go somewhere? The girl's slow Saturday moment carries the same sweet spirit of the painting I'd like us to consider this week. If we study the enchanted picture frame here at Idlewild Cottage, we'll see the hazelnuts come into focus. This tranquil scene was painted by French artist William Adolphe Bouguereau in 1882 and invites us into a quiet moment shared by two girls. Their gentle faces and relaxed poses speak of peace, serenity, and perhaps a whispered secret as well. These kindred spirits could very well represent my nieces too, so I want to give them one more special thank you for sharing with us this week. And friends, if you'd like to share ways in which Idlewild Cottage has inspired you, I'd love to hear from you. You can find me on Instagram at Idlewild Cottage. Also, as we grow our community, your likes, shares, and positive reviews will help us flourish. For, as one listener writes, I've been sharing it with friends, as this is a podcast for kindred spirits. Finally, into this moment of tranquility, I'll share from Psalm 52. We read of a fruitful tree, one that often represents peace. I am like an olive tree, flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. Kindred spirits, may you experience the flourishing that comes from trusting in the love of God. Thank you for joining me today, dear ones. Please come again soon to Idlewild Cottage. <music>